Returning home after four months at sea, I felt my bones ache with exhaustion, but at the same time, a warmth spread inside me at the thought of seeing my wife. The ship, the constant shift of day and night, the salt on my lips, and the wind in my face, all of it was familiar, but right now, I wanted only one thing, to cross the threshold of my home, leave my bag by the door, and feel the tension of the last few months dissipate. When I opened the door, everything in the house was in its place. My wife greeted me with a reserved smile, as if the years of marriage had already left their mark, and the usual joy was overshadowed by expectation. I knew that time apart had its effect, cooling our relationship, but I already had a plan to fix that. I decided that we needed something out of the ordinary to break up the monotony, something that would make us laugh together again and share joy and responsibilities. After a few days of thinking, I found the perfect surprise, an American bulldog. I imagined how its energy would become the new center of our home, making us both more active. This thought warned me because a dog is not just an animal, it's a loyal friend that can bring joy, responsibility, and even a bit of mischief, giving us something to do, making the house feel alive. I chose a strong, healthy puppy, knowing that it wouldn't be easy, but that was part of the idea. When I brought the puppy home, my wife didn't understand what was happening at first. She stood in the doorway, looking at me with surprise, but as soon as she saw the little bulldog, her eyes lit up. The joy on her face was genuine, as if she felt like a girl again, receiving a long-awaited gift. She took the puppy in her arms, and I saw how she immediately started interacting with it, with a lightness and warmth that I hadn't seen in a long time. I knew I'd hit the mark. In that moment, all my efforts and doubts were justified. The first week was pure chaos in the house. The dog quickly settled in and started exploring the home as its territory. We were both involved in the process, but of course, my wife took on most of the responsibility. She happily got up early in the morning to walk the puppy, carried it in her arms, fed it, and taught it basic obedience. I watched this with a smile, feeling that something special had returned between us. It felt like, along with the dog, something good and bright had returned to our lives, something we'd lost over time spent apart and long workdays. After a couple of weeks, I noticed that my wife started taking pictures of the puppy and sharing them on social media. It was unusual for me to see her holding her phone so often, but I decided that it was a good sign, it meant that she was genuinely happy with this new member of our family. We began spending more time together, walking in the park, playing with the dog on the grass. My wife told me funny stories that had happened while I was away, like when the puppy first saw its reflection in the mirror and how it reacted in a funny way. I listened to her, glad that I could bring back her genuine smile. The bulldog turned out to be quite stubborn and energetic, which actually made me happy. At first, it kept trying to chew on shoes, especially my boots, but after a couple of days, we established strict rules, and the dog began to understand what was allowed and what wasn't. My wife actively participated in training the puppy, and I noticed that it added a sense of purpose to her life that was hard to find when I was at sea. Instead of evenings when we each did our own thing, we now had joint activities, feeding, training, walking. We started sharing the joy of small moments again. The most pleasant moment for me was seeing that the dog I had given her had become more than just a new element of our home, it was a real bond between me and my wife. We both seemed to get a second wind in our relationship. I saw my wife waking up in the morning with enthusiasm, planning her day around walks and games with the dog. It changed my attitude towards the ordinary days too, they no longer seemed so routine when someone was always there, happy to see us no matter what. Friends came over to celebrate my return home. It had been a while since we last gathered like this, and I was genuinely looking forward to spending time with familiar faces, sharing stories, and enjoying each other's company. Everything was going well until I noticed an unfamiliar face among the group, a man who seemed completely out of place. I wasn't sure who he was, so I asked a few of my friends. They shrugged and said he was a friend of one of the guys and had insisted on coming along when he heard we had a puppy. They said it would have been awkward to refuse, so they let him join. I figured it wouldn't make sense to kick him out at this point, so I just nodded and let it slide. The guy seemed to have a strange fascination with our new bulldog. He immediately gravitated towards the dog, 
kneeling down to pet it, and started asking my wife all sorts of questions about the puppy. At first, I thought it was just harmless curiosity. The dog was, after all, quite adorable, and people often get excited when they see a puppy. But as the evening progressed, I began to notice how much of his attention was focused solely on our dog and my wife. He barely spoke to anyone else and kept making comments that felt a little too personal, always steering the conversation back to the dog. He also started making some odd jokes, which didn't sit right with me. One time, he laughed and said that dogs were better partners than husbands and could even replace them. He chuckled as if it was the funniest thing in the world, but I didn't find it amusing at all. I glanced over at my wife to see her reaction, but she just smiled politely and continued discussing the puppy with him as if she hadn't heard his strange comment. It made me feel uneasy, but I decided not to make a scene. After all, it was supposed to be a celebration, and I didn't want to spoil the mood for everyone else. I kept an eye on the guy as the evening went on. He was still glued to my wife and the dog, talking about training techniques, feeding routines, and other topics that were mostly mundane. But there was something in the way he spoke, the way he leaned in when talking to her, that rubbed me the wrong way. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I didn't like the vibe he was giving off. It wasn't just his interest in the dog that bothered me, it was the way he seemed to almost ignore everyone else in the room. I tried to keep myself busy, talking to my friends, catching up on what I'd missed during my months at sea. But I found it hard to fully engage when I could see this guy constantly hovering near my wife. I wasn't the type to get jealous easily, but there was something unsettling about the whole situation. He was too familiar, too comfortable, and I didn't like it. Still, I reminded myself that it was just one evening, and I wasn't about to let it ruin my time with friends. At one point, I walked over to them, hoping my presence might change the dynamic a bit. I joined the conversation, asking my wife a question about the dog, trying to steer the discussion in a different direction. The guy barely acknowledged me, instead making another joke about how dogs are more loyal than people. My wife gave a small laugh, clearly just trying to be polite, but I felt a flash of irritation. I forced myself to take a breath and let it go. It wasn't worth causing a scene over some random guy's bad sense of humor. Eventually, the evening began to wind down and people started to leave. The strange guy lingered a bit longer than everyone else, still petting the dog and chatting with my wife. I made a point of standing nearby, making it clear that it was time for him to go. He finally got the hint, said his goodbyes, and left without much fuss. I closed the door behind him, feeling a sense of relief wash over me. The house felt different with him gone, he calmer, more like home again. After the guests had left, I decided it was time to ask my wife about that strange guy. The way he had acted all evening didn't sit right with me and I needed to know what was going on. I found her in the kitchen, tidying up, and approached her, trying to keep my tone casual. I asked her who he was and why he seemed so interested in our dog. My wife looked up at me, a little surprised by the question, but then she smiled and explained that he was a dog trainer, a professional who worked with difficult breeds, and apparently, he'd offered to train our bulldog for a very reasonable fee. She seemed genuinely excited about the prospect, talking about how the trainer had mentioned some advanced techniques that could help with the dog's stubbornness. She thought it was a great opportunity, especially since we were still adjusting to having such an energetic pet. She explained that it would save us a lot of time and make our life easier in the long run. I listened, but something about it still didn't sit right with me. The way the guy had acted during the evening, it wasn't just about the dog. He'd been overly familiar, too focused on her, and I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to it than just his interest in training. I voiced my concerns, telling her that I thought the guy was a little too obsessed with dogs. I even joked that he probably liked dogs more than people, and maybe he'd replaced his family with them. My wife just laughed it off, dismissing my worries as unfounded. She said he was just passionate about his work, and there was nothing wrong with that. To her, it seemed like a harmless enthusiasm, something that could only benefit us in the long run. She even playfully scolded me for being overly suspicious, saying that I should be happy someone was so eager to help us out with the dog. I wasn't so sure, but I didn't want to argue. 
She seemed set on the idea, and I knew that pushing back too hard would only create tension. Despite my reservations, my wife went ahead and made arrangements with the dog trainer. She was determined to go through with it, convinced that his expertise would be beneficial for our dog. She laughed off my concerns and assured me that everything would be fine. She showed me the schedule she had worked out for the training sessions, and I could see how enthusiastic she was about making it all happen. I decided to let it be for now, hoping that maybe she was right. The next day, my wife received a call from the trainer, and I could tell from her side of the conversation that they were finalizing the details. She looked genuinely happy, and I didn't want to ruin that for her. She told me later that evening that they had agreed to start the training next week, and that the trainer had even offered to give us a discount since he enjoyed working with bulldogs so much. I still wasn't completely comfortable with it, but I nodded and said it sounded good. I figured I could at least be there for the first couple of sessions to see how things went. The training sessions began, and at first, everything seemed fine. The dog responded well, and my wife was thrilled with the progress. The trainer showed up on time, always with a smile, and had a calm and confident approach to handling the dog. I watched from a distance during those first few sessions, trying to get a sense of how things were going. The bulldog, despite its stubborn nature, seemed to be picking up the commands. It all seemed good on the surface, but as time went on, I couldn't help but notice that these sessions started to drag on longer than they should. Each training session was supposed to last an hour, but more often than not, they stretched to two or even three hours. I tried to justify it at first, maybe the dog needed extra attention, maybe the trainer was just being thorough. But it started to bother me when I realized that the trainer wasn't just spending time with the dog. He would stay afterwards, chatting with my wife, lingering in our home even after the dog had clearly had enough for the day. It seemed like every time I turned around, there he was, sitting comfortably in our living room, still talking to my wife as if he belonged there. I began to drop subtle hints that it was time for him to leave, but he either ignored them or didn't catch on. I would walk into the room, make a comment about how late it was getting, or mention that we had other plans. He would just smile and keep talking, as if my words had no weight. My wife, on the other hand, seemed oblivious to my discomfort. She would laugh at his jokes, offer him coffee, and act as though this was all perfectly normal. It irritated me, but I didn't want to make a scene. I tried to tell myself that it was just about the training, that I was overreacting, but the feeling in my gut told me otherwise. It wasn't just the length of the sessions that bothered me, it was the way the trainer behaved around my wife. He had this overly friendly demeanor, always finding reasons to compliment her or engage her in conversation. It wasn't anything overt, nothing that I could point to and say, this is wrong, but it was enough to make me uncomfortable. I started to feel a growing sense of dislike towards him. It wasn't just jealousy, it was a sense that he was crossing boundaries, that he was too comfortable in my home, too familiar with my wife. And the fact that she didn't seem to notice only made it worse. One evening, after yet another session that had dragged on far too long, I finally decided to bring it up with my wife. I told her that I didn't like how the trainer was always staying late, how he seemed to be making himself a little too comfortable in our home. She seemed surprised by my words, almost defensive. She insisted that the trainer was just dedicated to his work, that he was putting in extra effort to make sure the dog was properly trained. She told me that I should be grateful that he was willing to spend so much time with our pet, especially for the price he was charging. I could tell she didn't see things the way I did, and that frustrated me. I didn't want to argue, but I knew I couldn't let it go. I told her that I understood she wanted the best for the dog, but that I wasn't comfortable with the way things were going. I suggested that we find another trainer, someone just as qualified, but more professional. I reminded her that we could afford it, that it wasn't about the money but about the boundaries that were being crossed. She was clearly unhappy with my suggestion, arguing that the dog had already bonded with this trainer, that changing now would disrupt the progress they had made. I listened, but I stood my ground. Eventually, after a long discussion, she reluctantly agreed. I could tell she wasn't happy about it, but she said she would talk to the trainer and let him know that we wouldn't be continuing with his services. She made it clear that she didn't fully understand my concerns, but she was willing to respect my wishes. 
It wasn't the outcome she wanted, but it was the one I needed. I thanked her, trying to ease the tension, and told her that I just wanted what was best for all of us, including our relationship. While I was away at sea, my wife made sure to keep me updated about everything at home. She sent me photos of the dog regularly, along with little stories about their day-to-day -day life. The pictures showed our bulldog looking happy, well-trained, and obedient, and my wife always reassured me that everything was going smoothly. She seemed genuinely happy, and it put my mind at ease. I had been worried about how things would be after we stopped working with that trainer, but her messages made me feel like it had all been for the best. She seemed to be doing a great job managing everything by herself. The photos of the dog sitting obediently, playing in the yard, or just lounging around the house, were a constant reminder that things were okay back home. I felt like the tension that had been between us before I left had dissipated. My wife had taken charge of the dog's training, and it looked like everything was falling into place. It made me realize that maybe I had been overthinking things. Perhaps my concerns about the trainer were exaggerated, and now that he was out of the picture, everything seemed more settled. Over time, I started to relax. I focused on my work, knowing that my wife and our dog were doing well without me. I didn't feel the need to ask about the trainer anymore, it felt like a closed chapter. My wife never mentioned him again, and I took that as a good sign. She seemed content, and the dog was thriving. It was exactly what I had hoped for. I felt like we had overcome a small hurdle in our marriage, and now we were stronger for it. The distance made me appreciate the effort she was putting in, and I knew I had made the right decision to trust her. After four long months at sea, I finally returned home. The moment I walked through the door, I was greeted by the familiar sights and smells of our home. My wife came to meet me with a smile, and the dog bounded up to me, tail wagging furiously. Everything seemed perfect. The house was in order, my wife looked genuinely happy, and the dog was better behaved than ever. I felt an overwhelming sense of relief. It felt good to be back, to see that everything was as it should be. One evening, while we were sitting together, I casually asked her if she had heard anything from the trainer after she told him they wouldn't need his services anymore. She looked at me, a bit hesitant at first, and then admitted that the trainer had been a little upset when she broke the news. He had agreed to step away without any issues, but he had expressed some disappointment, enough that my wife had even felt a bit sorry for him. Hearing that, I felt a flash of irritation. I told her firmly that his feelings shouldn't concern her, he was just a trainer, and his disappointment was his own problem. She nodded, agreeing with me, and I could tell she understood where I was coming from. One afternoon, I was using the computer my wife and I shared, trying to look up some information about pet care. As I was browsing, I stumbled upon a strange open tab. It wasn't something I had ever seen before, and curiosity got the better of me. I clicked on it, and to my shock, I found myself staring at a forum discussing disturbing and revolting ways of using dogs for personal satisfaction. My first thought was that it had to be some kind of pop-up or virus. It didn't make any sense for something like this to be on our computer. I sat there for a moment, staring at the screen, trying to process what I was seeing. It made my stomach turn. I couldn't understand why such a disgusting page would be open on our computer. My instinct was to close it immediately, but a part of me needed to know how it got there. Was it really just some random ad or something more? I decided I needed to ask my wife about it, even if it was an awkward topic. I called her over, trying to keep my voice calm. When she came into the room, I asked her if she knew anything about the tab. I could see her expression change as soon as she saw what was on the screen. Her face went pale, and she looked genuinely taken aback. She stammered for a moment, then told me that she had no idea how it got there. She suggested it must have been some kind of spam or an accidental click. Her voice was shaky, and she seemed nervous, which only made me feel more uneasy. I wanted to believe her. I really did. It made sense that it could have been some sort of pop-up or a result of careless browsing. But the way she reacted made me doubt that explanation. She was clearly uncomfortable, and there was something about her demeanor that felt off. I pressed her a little more, 
asking if she was sure she hadn't clicked on something by mistake or if she knew why it was there. She insisted that she had no idea and that it must have been some kind of spam. Seeing her so flustered made me uneasy. I decided not to push her any further, at least not at that moment. I told her that we should run a virus scan on the computer to make sure nothing like that happened again. She quickly agreed, almost too eagerly, and I could tell she wanted to put the whole thing behind us as soon as possible. I let it go for the time being, but the whole situation left a bad taste in my mouth. It wasn't something I could easily forget. After she left the room, I ran a full virus scan on the computer, hoping that it would give me some kind of answer. The skin came back clean, which only added to my confusion. If it wasn't a virus, then how had that page ended up on our computer? I tried to convince myself that it could have been a random pop-up, something that had slipped through the filters. But the doubt lingered, gnawing at the back of my mind. I couldn't shake the feeling that there was more to it than just a simple mistake. Over the next few days, I found myself watching my wife more closely. I didn't want to be suspicious of her, but I couldn't help it. The incident with the computer had planted a seed of doubt, and no matter how much I tried to ignore it, it was still there. She seemed to be acting normal, going about her daily routine, but I couldn't help but wonder if there was something she wasn't telling me. It was a horrible thought, and I hated that I was even considering it, but the unease wouldn't leave me. I decided that I needed to keep an eye on things, at least for a while. Maybe it really had been just a random pop-up, and I was overreacting. But until I knew for sure, I couldn't let my guard down. I loved my wife, and I wanted to trust her completely, but something about the whole situation just didn't add up. I hoped that I was wrong, that it was all just a misunderstanding, but I knew I couldn't ignore my instincts. Not this time. The next morning, I received a call from work asking me to come in for some routine paperwork. It seemed like a minor inconvenience, but I figured I'd take care of it quickly and get back home. I left the house, telling my wife I'd be back later. As I was on my way, I received another call, this time from my supervisor, letting me know that the request had been a mistake and that there was no need for me to come in after all. Relieved that I didn't have to deal with unnecessary bureaucracy, I turned the car around and headed back home. Pulling into the driveway, I noticed how quiet the house was. I walked in, expecting to find my wife in the kitchen or perhaps in the living room with the dog. Instead, there was an eerie silence. Moving through the house, I headed toward the bedroom. Something felt off. I moved quietly, not wanting to startle her if she was asleep. When I reached the bedroom door, I pushed it open slightly, and what I saw made my heart drop. On our bed was my wife, completely naked, with the dog between her legs. Her body moved in a way that made my stomach churn. She didn't notice me standing there, her eyes were closed, and she was muttering something under her breath. I strained to hear her words, and what I heard made my blood run cold. She said she didn't need me, not when she had the dog. It was grotesque, like a twisted nightmare that had come to life before my eyes. My hands shook as I pulled out my phone. I needed proof, even though everything inside me screamed to look away. I started recording, my heart pounding in my chest, overwhelmed by a mix of rage, disgust, and disbelief. I couldn't understand how it had come to this. The woman I loved, the woman I trusted, was doing something so vile. The casual way she spoke about not needing me cut deeper than anything else. Time seemed to slow down, every second stretching into eternity. My body felt numb, caught between the urge to storm into the room and the instinct to turn away and leave forever. But I couldn't move. I stood there, recording, my hands trembling as I held the phone steady. Everything I knew, everything I believed in, shattered in that moment. There was no going back from this. After a few minutes, I took a deep breath, stepping back from the door. I needed to think, to figure out my next move. I knew I couldn't let her know I was there, not yet. I turned and quietly left the house, my mind racing, my stomach churning with a mix of emotions I couldn't even begin to sort out. Everything had changed in an instant, and I knew there was no way to fix it. I looked down at the phone in my hand, the video still there, a sickening reminder of what I had just witnessed. 
the evidence was undeniable. There was no forgiveness for this, no coming back. The woman I thought I knew was gone, replaced by someone I could no longer recognize. The hollow emptiness in my chest felt unbearable, the weight of betrayal almost suffocating. Standing outside, I tried to steady my breathing. I knew I had to confront her eventually, but I also knew I needed to be smart about it. I had the proof, and I wasn't going to let her twist things around or make excuses. For now, I needed to gather myself, to think clearly about what came next. I wasn't going to let her see me break. This wasn't over, not by a long shot, and I would make sure she faced the consequences of what she had done. I knew that the marriage was over. The betrayal I had witnessed was something I could never move past. But before I could walk away, I needed answers. I needed to confront her, to make sure she knew that I had seen everything, and to understand what had brought us to this point. The thought of the dog trainer crossed my mind. It all made sense now. I knew I had to go back inside and face her, to demand an explanation. I took a deep breath and walked back into the house, my footsteps heavy on the floor. I entered the hallway and cleared my throat loudly, letting her know I was there. I heard a startled gasp from the bedroom, followed by hurried movement. She must have realized she had been caught. Moments later, she appeared in the doorway, her face flushed, her eyes wide with fear. You don't understand, she screamed, her voice trembling. I felt a flash of anger, a cold determination settling in me. I wasn't going to let her get away with this. I told her to hand me her phone. She hesitated, her eyes darting around as if looking for an escape. I repeated my demand, my voice calm but unyielding. She had no choice. Reluctantly, she handed over her phone, her hands trembling. I unlocked it and began scrolling through her messages. It didn't take long to find what I was looking for the conversations with the dog trainer. My suspicions had been right all along. He had been coming to our house every week, and their messages were filled with references to the training sessions. The more I read, the more disgusted I felt. The trainer had been coming over every Wednesday, and the messages made it clear that this wasn't just about training the dog. There were detailed discussions about the commands he had taught the dog, commands that my wife had been using for her own sick purposes. My hand shook as I scrolled through the messages, each one more damning than the last. It had been going on for months, right under my nose, and I had been too blind to see it. I looked up at her, my expression cold and distant. She was standing there, tears streaming down her face, her mouth moving as if trying to find the right words. But there were no words that could fix this, nothing she could say that would make it better. I held up the phone, showing her the messages. How long? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She broke down, her knees giving way as she sank to the floor, sobbing. She tried to explain, to tell me that she hadn't meant for it to happen, that it had all gotten out of control. But I wasn't interested in her excuses. The realization of how long this had been going on hit me like a punch to the gut. Every Wednesday, while I was at work, they had been here, using my home, my bed. The trainer had taught the dog commands that my wife had used to fulfill her twisted desires. The betrayal was deeper than anything I could have imagined. It wasn't just the act itself, it was the lies, the deception, the complete disregard for our marriage and everything we had built together. I stood there, looking down at her, feeling nothing but emptiness. The woman I had loved, the woman I had trusted, was gone. In her place was someone I didn't recognize, someone who had shattered everything we had. I told her that I was done, that there was no coming back from this. She looked up at me, her face twisted in anguish, but I felt nothing. No sympathy, no pity. Just a cold, hollow void where my love for her used to be. I turned and walked away, leaving her there on the floor, her sobs echoing through the house. I knew that this was the end. There was no fixing what had been broken, no way to rebuild the trust that she had destroyed. I had the proof I needed, and now it was time to move on. There was nothing left for me here, nothing worth saving. The woman I had once loved was gone, and all that remained was the shattered pieces of a life that could never be put back together. I told her to get out. 
The words came out cold and final, and I meant every one of them. She screamed, she cried, she tried to grab my arm, pleading for me to listen, to let her explain. But there was nothing left to say. The betrayal, the lies, the revolting actions I had witnessed, there was no forgiveness for that. I pushed her away, pointing towards the door, my voice unwavering as I repeated myself. Get out. She stumbled back, her face twisted in desperation, but I was done. There was no more room for her in my life, in my home. I grabbed her phone and the evidence I had gathered. I took pictures, recorded everything, the messages, the video, the disgusting proof of what she had done. I needed it all documented. I wasn't going to give her a chance to twist the story, to lie her way out of this. She tried to grab her phone back, but I stepped away, telling her that she had lost any right to privacy the moment she betrayed me. Her cries echoed through the house, but I stayed focused, making sure I had every piece of evidence I needed. She begged me to let her stay, to talk things through, but I wasn't interested. I opened the front door and gestured for her to leave. She hesitated, her eyes wide with panic, but I wasn't going to back down. I told her that she needed to leave now, that there was nothing left for her here. She tried to argue, to say that we could fix things, that it wasn't what it looked like. But I knew better. I had seen enough, heard enough. There was no fixing this. I raised my voice, telling her once again to get out. Finally, she stepped through the door, her sobs growing louder as I closed it behind her. Once she was outside, she turned back, banging on the door, pleading to be let back in. I stood there for a moment, listening to her cries, feeling nothing but emptiness. I opened the door just enough to tell her that her things would be sent to her mother's house. She tried to push her way back in, but I blocked her, my expression hard. I wasn't going to let her back into my life, not after everything she had done. I told her to leave the property before I called the police. The threat seemed to register, and she backed away, her face a mask of despair. I watched as she walked away, her shoulders shaking with sobs. I didn't feel any satisfaction, just a cold sense of finality. This was the end, and there was no turning back. I locked the door, the sound echoing through the empty house. I stood there for a moment, taking in the silence. It was over. She was gone, and for the first time in what felt like an eternity, I was alone. I took a deep breath, trying to steady myself, to process everything that had just happened. The house felt different now, empty but somehow lighter, as if a weight had been lifted. I went through the house, gathering her belongings, tossing them into bags without a second thought. Clothes, shoes, personal items, everything went into the bags. I didn't care about being gentle or careful. I just wanted it all gone, every trace of her out of my home. I didn't want any reminders of what she had done, of the betrayal that had destroyed everything we had. Once the bags were packed, I placed them by the door, ready to be sent to her mother's. It was the last thing I could do for her, and even that felt like more than she deserved. After I finished packing her things, I sat down, the exhaustion finally catching up with me. The adrenaline that had kept me going was fading, leaving behind a hollow emptiness. I looked around the house, at the life we had built together, now lying in ruins. The photos on the walls, the little decorations she had picked out, they all felt meaningless now. I knew I had to get rid of them, to erase every reminder of her, but for now, I just sat there, taking it all in. This was my reality now, and I had to face it. The dog, unaware of the chaos that had just unfolded, wandered over to me, nudging my leg with its nose. I looked down at it, my mind replaying everything I had seen, everything I had learned. The dog was innocent in all of this, a victim just like me. I reached down, patting its head, feeling a strange sense of comfort in its presence. It wasn't the dog's fault. It had been manipulated, just like I had. I decided then and there that I would keep the dog. It wasn't to blame, and I wasn't going to let her take it away too. After packing her things and finally having some time to breathe, I decided that I wasn't going to let her betrayal be swept under the rug. It wasn't enough just to kick her out, I needed to make sure the truth was known. The evidence I had gathered, the video, the messages, it was all going to come out. 
People needed to know what kind of person she really was, and I wasn't going to hold back. I grabbed my phone and began the process of exposing everything. First, I sent the video and the screenshots of her conversations with the dog trainer to our shared friends. I included a simple message, this is why she's no longer in my life. The responses started coming in almost immediately, shock, disbelief, anger. My phone buzzed non-stop, friends asking questions, expressing their disgust. There was no way to soften the blow, no way to make it any less horrifying. I wanted them all to see her for what she had done, to understand why I had to end things the way I did. Next, I turned to social media. I wasn't the type to air my dirty laundry in public, but this was different. This wasn't just about me, this was about what she and the trainer had done, the disgusting betrayal, the abuse of an innocent animal. I posted the evidence, careful not to reveal anything that could get me in trouble legally. I wanted the truth to be known, but I wasn't about to jeopardize my own safety in the process. The post went live, and within minutes, it started gaining attention. People were sharing it, commenting, expressing their horror and outrage. The more I watched the post spread, the more determined I became. This wasn't just about revenge, it was about making sure that neither of them could ever do something like this again. The trainer had used his position to manipulate my wife, to teach the dog commands that were then used for vile purposes. It was beyond betrayal, it was abuse, plain and simple. I knew there would be consequences, that this would blow up, but I was ready for it. They deserved to face the repercussions of their actions. It didn't take long for the backlash to start. People were tagging the dog trainer, calling him out for his behavior, demanding answers. His social media pages were flooded with comments, and it was clear that he wasn't going to be able to hide from this. The evidence was out there, and there was no denying it. I watched as the comments rolled in, as people expressed their disgust and called for action. It was a small comfort, knowing that I wasn't the only one who saw how wrong this was. Then came the messages from strangers, people who had seen my post and felt compelled to reach out. Some offered words of support, while others shared their own stories of betrayal. It was overwhelming, the sheer volume of responses, but it made me feel less alone. This wasn't just my fight anymore, it was something bigger, something that had struck a chord with people who had been hurt, betrayed, and lied to. It didn't change what had happened, but it gave me a sense of purpose, a reason to keep pushing forward. Soon, the authorities got involved. I received a call from an officer who wanted to discuss the evidence I had shared. They were opening an investigation into the trainer and my wife for animal abuse. The officer asked me to come in and provide a statement, and I agreed without hesitation. This was what I wanted, justice, not just for me, but for the innocent animal that had been dragged into this twisted mess. I knew it wouldn't be easy, that there would be questions and scrutiny, but I was ready for it. The news spread, and soon it wasn't just friends and acquaintances who knew, it was everyone. The local news picked up the story, and suddenly, it was everywhere. People were talking about it, sharing it, condemning their actions. The trainer's business was effectively over, his reputation destroyed. My wife, too, faced the public backlash, her name was now associated with something so vile that there was no coming back from it. It wasn't about revenge anymore, it was about making sure they faced the consequences of their actions. Filing for divorce was the natural next step. There was nothing left to salvage, nothing worth trying to fix. The betrayal had been too deep, too twisted, and I needed to put an end to it once and for all. I gathered the necessary documents, contacted a lawyer, and filed for divorce. It wasn't an emotional decision, it was simply the right one. The court proceedings moved quickly, given the circumstances and the overwhelming evidence I had. The judge ruled in my favor, and just like that, it was over. The marriage that I had once cherished was dissolved, leaving me free to move forward with my life. After the court decision, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The weight that had been pressing down on my shoulders since the day I discovered her betrayal seemed to lift, allowing me to breathe again. I knew there would still be challenges ahead, that healing wouldn't be immediate, but I finally felt like I had control over my life again. I had made the right choice, and I was ready to start over. 
It wasn't about revenge or anger anymore, it was about finding peace and moving on from the nightmare that had consumed my life. A few days after the divorce was finalized, my ex-wife showed up at my doorstep with the trainer. They demanded that I delete the recordings, both of them pleading and threatening in turn. The trainer tried to intimidate me, puffing out his chest as if he could bully me into compliance. My ex-wife looked desperate, her eyes wide with fear. It was almost pathetic, seeing them both there, trying to undo the consequences of their actions. I wasn't moved by their pleas. I told them both to leave, that I had no intention of erasing anything. The trainer, clearly frustrated, decided to try another approach. He attempted to sick the dog on me, giving it some command in a stern voice. But the dog, which had been standing by my side, simply looked confused before running off. I couldn't help but laugh, it was clear that the only commands this man could teach were disgusting, intimate ones. He had no real control over the dog, and it was obvious. The dog knew where it belonged, and it wasn't with him. The trainer's attempt to intimidate me had failed miserably, and it only made him look weaker. Angry and humiliated, the trainer then tried to attack me himself. He lunged at me, throwing a wild punch, but it was clumsy and lacked any real power. I dodged easily, and with one swift motion, I retaliated, landing a solid blow that sent him stumbling backward. He wasn't prepared for a real fight, and it showed. Within moments, he was on the ground, scrambling to get back up. He looked at me, his eyes full of anger and fear, and then he turned and ran, leaving my ex-wife standing there, her face pale and tear-streaked. She tried to approach me, her voice breaking as she begged me to take her back. She pleaded, saying that she was sorry, that she had made a mistake. I listened to her for a moment, letting her words hang in the air between us. But there was nothing she could say that would change anything. The damage had been done, and there was no going back. I looked at her, my expression hard, and told her to leave. I wasn't going to let her back into my life, not after everything she had done. I had given her enough chances, and she had thrown them all away. I watched as she turned and walked away, her shoulders slumped in defeat. There was no satisfaction in it, no sense of victory, just a cold finality. She had made her choices, and now she had to live with them. As she disappeared from view, I felt a sense of closure. It was truly over. There were no more loose ends, no more unfinished business. She was out of my life, and I was finally free to move on, without the shadow of her betrayal hanging over me. The days that followed were quiet, but in the silence, I found a sense of peace. I began to focus on rebuilding my life, one step at a time. There was still a lot of work to do, but for the first time in a long time, I felt hopeful. I had faced the worst, and I had come out the other side. The future was uncertain, but it was mine to shape, and that was enough for me. I knew that there would be challenges ahead, but I was ready to face them. Alone, but stronger for everything I had endured. 